most phenotypes are controlled by more than one gene. And in our last chapter, chapter six, that mainly focused on natural selection and genetic drift, those concepts, those topics were mainly addressed uh, by looking at examining uh, one gene that has multiple alleles. But many phenotypes have a more much more complex have much more complex genetic control uh, such that uh, multiple genes potentially are affecting the same phenotype so disentangling the genetics that controls these kinds of phenotypes uh, can be quite challenging but there are tools that have been developed and we are able to understand the complex genetic basis of phenotypes and understand and study their evolution. And this whole field of research that we're talking about here is called quantitative genetics. And indeed, we apply quantitative genetics to the understanding of the evolution of phenotypes. And that's what this chapter is all about. So the introductory story here is about old field mice. That's their common name, uh, specifically the species Paromyscus polyanotus. And uh, this story talks about populations of these mice that live in the southeastern United States. Uh, some inhabit white sand dunes that are right along the coast and Others inhabit inland uh, brown farm fields, you know, brown grass, etc. Now, these beaches along the coast formed pretty recently, geologically speaking, just about four to six thousand years ago. And the mice that are found living along those beaches have a different phenotype from the mice that live inland. The ones that live on the beaches uh, have white coloration over part of their body and uh, other characteristics that seem to be related to uh, that environment, that habitat of sandy white beaches. So uh, Hopi Hoekstra is a researcher that's uh, focused here and she's understanding and looking at the genetics and the evolution of these colors taking a quantitative genetics approach so the whole entire genome of the common mouse mus musculus was sequenced in 2002 so pretty early on in terms of uh, whole genome sequences and Mus musculus was sequenced because it is a common model organism in laboratories. So having that complete genome uh, is very valuable. And it provides a basis to compare to paromyscus, which you know hadn't been um, completely sequenced. So as I'm emphasizing near the bottom here of the slide, the challenge here is that no single gene controls coat color. So a quantitative genetics approach has to be undertaken. So this chapter moves from the top down. It takes a top down approach. And what that means is that we are beginning with a phenotype, the observation of some kind of phenotype like coat color. And we're moving down to understand what genes affect that phenotype up above. So it's a top-down approach from that perspective, from phenotype down to what are the genes that are controlling that. So let's move forward and check this out. So let's take an introductory look then at the genetics of quantitative traits. So there's some terms here on the slide that you all are probably familiar with, perhaps understand pretty well, but because uh, they come from sort of upper division-ish genetics, uh, but we're now, of course, using these terms in the overall umbrella context of evolution. 
and how these types of genetic interactions and phenomena help to understand evolution. So there's many traits, phenotypes that are selected, that are favored or not favored by environmental factors, and they have a complicated genetic basis. Uh, so if they're controlled by more than one gene, then we say that they are polygenic. Poly many, genic, genes, many genes. So uh, these kinds of uh, traits that may be selected that are uh, quantitative, they may depend on what are called non-additive interactions. We're going to get into that in the next couple slides. Non-additive interactions between alleles at different loci. That's called epistasis, when the products, the proteins that are produced from one gene at one locus interact with the products, the proteins produced at another locus, and uh, affecting the phenotype because of the interactions of, of these proteins, these products. That is epistasis. Uh, they, again, the they, the pronoun here is referring to uh, quantitative traits. So they may be shaped by interactions between alleles and the environment. That's called phenotypic plasticity, and that is discussed uh, near the end of this chapter, near the end of this PowerPoint. So we see phenotypic plasticity when we have one genotype, but when that genotype is exposed to a range of environmental variables, we get multiple phenotypes. So uh, let's say temperature uh, determined uh, sex determination in turtles or in alligators is like that. You have two individuals that have the same genetic makeup, but based on the temperature that the eggs are exposed to, you might get a male alligator or a female alligator. Uh, they, there's the fourth asterisk here, uh, they, quantitative traits, often vary continuously among individuals. And so when you see that uh, continuous variation graphed, it usually forms some kind of a bell curve. You see this broad range of variation. And uh, those, that continuous variation is usually quantitative meaning it's you know based on many different genes and alleles not qualitative just black and white so right there we're introducing there are several different genetic influences and interactions that produce these <clears throat> complex quantitative traits studying the uh, evolution of these kinds of complex phenotypes is known as quantitative genetics. And so we can contrast that to population genetics, which is comparing the genetics of populations to you know, understand similarities and differences, the effects of gene flow, uh, genetic drift in different populations, etc. Quantitative genetics is focused on specific phenotypes and understanding the genetic basis of those. So it involves building models, models that include genetic variation, environmental variation, and interactions between genetics and environment. Pretty complex. And as I mentioned on the last slide, this involves a top-down approach. It starts with a distribution of phenotypes in a population, who has what, how common are they, etc. Then trying to identify the mechanisms, the causes for the distribution of those phenotypes. The graph that I'm showing you here, the figure showing you here on the slide out of your textbook, is representing what we see in terms of the range of variation as we have more uh, genes, more loci, affecting a single trait. So up on the top of the graph, up on the top of the figure, see if I can move my little camera here. 
put it over on the side. There goes my head. Uh, well, what if we just have one gene with two alleles? That's up on the top. So allele A1, allele A2. Well, then we're going to see uh, three different phenotypes if there are additive effects. That is, if you're homozygous for one of the alleles, you're going to show one phenotype. If you're homozygous for the other allele, you're going to show a second phenotype. And if you're heterozygous, you're going to show an intermediate phenotype that's representing a gene or alleles with additive effects. They add up. Figure B is showing you, well, what if there's two genes? that are affecting this one phenotype. And each of these two genes has two alleles, like A1, A2, B1, B2. Well, you start getting more combinations of what an individual could inherit from their parents in terms of these different alleles. You can see that in the figure. And we start to get a broader range of phenotypes. The bottom of the figure, figure C, is saying, well, what if there's three genes that are affecting this one phenotype? And each of these genes has two alleles. Well, look at that curve down the bottom. It's getting even more complex and getting more of this uh, broad um, distribution. So that's what we're talking about here is how to study phenotypes, the evolution of phenotypes that have more of this uh, uh, complex genetic basis. So as I may have mentioned already, uh, these complex phenotypic traits we're talking about, like coat color on the old field mice, skin color in human beings, uh, they typically vary continuously. So that if we graphed it out, we'd see this smooth range of variation, as opposed to like blocks of variation. You know, sort of black and white comparisons. And think of skin color. If you had a thousand people that you randomly selected in a room and, you know, uh, graphed or documented the range of variation in skin color, you would see this smooth, continuous relationship. So it yields, you know, in the world of statistics, a normal distribution of traits that are around a mean right in the middle with a range of variation on either side of that mean. So in order to study the evolution of these kinds of traits that show this kind of variation, this continuous variation, we need to be able to measure the amount of what's called variance. Variance. So variance is going to be popping up uh, in this chapter quite a bit. And uh, what variance is, it measures the distribution of uh, how widely dispersed the trait values are from the mean, from the middle. That's what variance measures. That's what variance is. So if you look at the graph that I uh, put here on the slide out of your book, showing you, for example, the light blue curve, it's in the middle, uh, is representing the range of variation in a trait uh, that shows fairly narrow variance. So you've got that high peak in the middle, that represents the mean, and then you have a distribution of uh, trait values on either side of that mean, and they're pretty tightly clustered around the mean, so that's narrow variance. Then if you look uh, at sort of the dark bluish curve, uh, the mean is kind of crunched down a little bit more, halfway down, and you see that the curve is spread out more on the sides, on the tails. So there's a wider variance. And then finally, we've got kind of this purplish curve that's very broad around the mean. So that's showing wide variance. So it's a nice visual that is trying to show you what variance is. So in order to measure variance, uh, we take a sample of organisms, for example, and we measure the value of each trait, of a trait. We measure the value of a trait. So for every single organism, we're documenting, observing, and measuring what uh, specific trait that organism has. 
Then we take that data and we measure how far each measurement from each organism uh, deviates from the mean. You know, what the difference is between that value and the mean. So you end up getting this table of a whole bunch of different uh, values for these differences. Then lastly, to calculate the variance, <clears throat> you take each deviation from the mean and you square it. You add them up and you divide by the total number of individuals. When you do that, you have a measure of the variance around the mean. So you should know how this is done. Um, I've looked at the end of the chapter. I didn't see a specific problem that, that had you do this, but this is kind of a statistics exercise. You all very well may have had statistics and you might understand how this would work. But the point here is for you to understand what variance is, uh, this range of variation around a mean, and that we need to be able to measure that variance in order to study the evolution of complex uh, phenotypes. Okay, let's continue our review discussion of variance. So total variance, total amount of variance in a phenotypic trait we designate by V sub P, the variance of the phenotype in the phenotype. And this total amount of variance that we can measure in a phenotype is the sum of the genetic variances, so the effects of genetics on that variation, and environmental variance the effects of the environment on those phenotypes. So the total amount of variance for any trait is the sum of those two things so far. So if you look at the figure here, it is depicting how this works, this combination of genetics and environment uh, that gives the total phenotypic variance. So what the figure is showing is a curve, a range of variation in a phenotype that is controlled by two genes, each with two alleles. And so we get this range of variation that forms this normal distribution. So this overall curve is very similar to what you saw in the figure a couple slides back in talking about uh, polygenic uh, traits. So you have the bars, the vertical blue bars, show the five phenotypic trait values that you can measure from the additive combinations of two alleles at each of two loci. And what you see here is this broad blue distribution Okay, showing you the overall distribution, but where does that come from? Where does that smooth, broad, na uh, normal distribution come from? Take a look at the little purple curves over each bar. Each little purple curve represents the distribution of phenotypes for that genotype. So like number one on the left is a particular genotype, a combination of alleles. And organisms with that combination of alleles, we can observe and measure, have that purplish distribution of phenotypes. Then we look at um, trait number two, and there's more organisms that are exhibiting that trait. And again, we've got a little purple curve over that bar representing the range of variation that is caused by the environment. And then we've got the mean uh, phenotype, most common, got a little purple curve, etc. Now the overlap of those little tiny distributions, those little tiny curves for each trait, uh, that's what results in the smooth, normal blue curve overall. 
So the overlap and variation from each of those genotypes, the overlap and phenotypic variation from each of those genotypes ends up giving us this normal distribution. And the overall summary or point of this is that that normal distribution, that range of phenotypes overall is a result of a combination of genetic and environmental effects, both of them, V sub G and V sub E together give our total phenotypic variance. So you may remember hearing or reading uh, about the topic of heritability to say that only traits of organisms that are heritable can be affected by natural selection. That's something that uh, I usually mention in, say, a Bio 182 class, but we don't get into really, you know, depth what heritability is. But we need to here when we're studying the evolution of complex traits and getting down into the trenches with it. So what is heritability? Heritability, the proportion of the total phenotypic variation uh, that's attributable, that can be pegged with uh, genetic variation among individuals. So some of the variation is uh, environmental, and that environmental variation uh, has to be excluded because that kind of variation uh, is not influenced by uh, natural selection, but only the genetic component. So we need to be able to identify that genetic component in order to understand the evolution of these traits. So there's uh, several different ways to estimate what heritability is uh, in a population. But one of the ways is called broad sense heritability. And it's represented by the uppercase H, the square sign. And what broad sense heritability is, is the variance in a trait that's due only to genetics divided by the total amount of variance in the phenotype. So that helps to isolate the genetic component of variance from the environmental component of variance and give you a proportion. Because the total uh, phenotypic variance is the variance due to genotype and environment that's represented on the, the bottom uh, term of that equation. And so that ratio genetic variance divided by total phenotypic variance is going to give us, in a broad sense, uh, the degree to which the variance, the total variance, is affected by genetics. Meiosis, as you know, takes pairs of alleles that are on homologous chromosomes. And while those alleles exist in an organism, then uh, there might be interactions between them, interactions with other alleles from other loci that result, help result in a phenotype. Again, phenotypes are affected by many different aspects, like I reviewed a couple slides ago, epistasis, etc. Only some of the genetic variation uh, contributes to a phenotypic resemblance between offspring and parents, like the degree to which you resemble one parent or the other of your parent. Uh, only some of the genetic variation that you have contributes to that resemblance. And it's only that part of the variance in a phenotype, just that one component, that enables a population to evolve over generations in response to natural selection. So we need to be able to isolate and identify that part of the variance and see uh, how much there is, because that is what's gonna help us understand uh, the evolution of these complex phenotypic traits.
And so for this reason, because it's just this one narrow component of the genetic variants that is important for natural selection, it's really helpful to break down the variants due to genetics into its separate components, the separate genetic components that give the total genetic variants. So we can say at the bottom of this slide, V sub G, the variance due to genetics, is equal to the sum of the different genetic components. And one of those uh, components is the amount of var the variance due to additive components, additive alleles. The other genetic component is variance due to dominant alleles. Those alleles only show their dominant effect when they are paired up by chance with a recessive allele. That's the only time the effects of dominant alleles are shown. Special condition. And then finally, V sub I is the variance due to epistasis, the interactions between loci. So those three components, additive variance, dominance variance, and epistasis variance, those all make up the genetic components of variance. Finally, the total phenotypic variance then is all three of those components, all those genetic components, plus the variance due to the environment. So in sum here for this slide, we're introducing what heritability is. So get that down in your mind. Then we're saying, okay, one way to estimate it is this broad sense, heritability. It's like genetic variance divided by phenotypic variance. And then finally, we're saying, well, only part of that genetic variance is uh, enables a population to evolve. So we need to be able to isolate that. It's the additive part. And so let's break down that genetic variance into these different components, understand that there are these components so we can start to see the bigger picture. Okay, let's move on. Okay. As I mentioned, among other things, on the last slide, uh, the variance due to additive effects is especially important to studying evolution. Relatives resemble each other. You know, you resemble your brothers or sisters. If you have any, you resemble your parents, you resemble your aunts and uncles, etc., because relatives have more alleles in common than non-relatives do. And so uh, that's the additive component of variance that we are seeing, that uh, uh, similarity due to additive effects. The variation that's due to dominant effects, dominant alleles, recessive alleles, and the variance that's due to epistatic effects, Okay, those are due, that kind of variance is due to interactions between alleles, not just the isolated effect of the individual alleles. Those are additive. So, you know, dominance effects, well, you only see a dominant effect if, if that allele shows up with, you know, a recessive allele or two dominants. Otherwise, if you have two recessive alleles, then you see a different effect. So the dominant effect uh, of alleles you know, is due to interactions between, with recessive ones. Epistatic effects, the variance due to epistasis is, you know, the interactions of uh, proteins, products from different genes, okay? So those are interactions between alleles. Uh, those are not important for the evolution of populations. They're important for the expression of traits in individual organisms, but they're not important for evolution. So because that additive component is so important, biologists might choose to only calculate the proportion, you know, the fraction of the total variance of a trait that's attributable to just the additive effects. So let's isolate and narrow down and identify just the additive effects. So we call that the narrow sense heritability, little h, lowercase h squared. And the 
uh, narrow sense heritability is uh, what really is determining the uh, effect of genetics on the evolution of traits in a population. So narrow sense heritability is the variance due to additive effects divided by the total phenotypic variance, okay? So then we can break down that phenotypic variance like we did on the previous slides and say, okay, then that means that narrow sense heritability is due to the variance due to additive effects divided by the uh, genetic variance plus the environmental variance, total phenotypic variance. And then we can break down that genetic variance like we did on the previous slide even more to isolate all those components. Narrow sense heritability is the variance due to additive effects, just isolating that, divided by variance from additive effects plus dominant effects plus epistatic effects plus environmental effects. So boom, 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 all those added together. Okay, that's what it is. That's what narrow sense heritability is. And measuring narrow sense variability uh, tells us to what degree additive alleles are, have an effect on a particular trait, phenotype. So we've got a few different plots uh, on this figure that's out of your book on the slide. And uh, one way to uh, estimate narrow sense heritability is by uh, determining the slope of a regression line. And the slope is the narrow sense heritability. So the shallower the slope, that means there's a, a very low narrow sense heritability. There's a very low additive effect on the total variance. Uh, but if the slope's higher, then that tells you that there's a greater additive effect. There's a greater narrow sense heritability. So we are able to uh, see what the slope is by plotting offspring body size against the body size of the parents. And the slope of that regression line is, as I mentioned, narrow sense heritability. So figure A is showing you, okay, average height of parents in humans plotted against the height of offspring and we can see there's a wide range of variation there but there is a slope to that line and that slope is saying that's the degree to which the uh, height has is affected by additive effects uh, for the birds they look like maybe a swallow down on the figure b mid parent tarsus length so you have both parents, both parent birds. You measure the tarsus, which is part of the foot. And so, you know, what's the value between the, the, the father's tarsus and the mother's tarsus? What's the, the midpoint value? Okay, so you get that. And you plot that against the offspring's mean tarsus length. And you get a line. And that tells you the narrow sense heritability, the amount of additive uh, variance that affects that tarsus length. And then finally, figure C is pistil length in this uh, species of flower. Remember, the pistil is uh, got the ovary of the flower and the uh, uh, style and the stigma. So that's the pistil. So, okay, we can measure the mid. Uh, parent pistol length, so between the, the two parent plants, we can get those values and plot that against the um, offspring's mean pistol length. And once again, uh, that slope is our narrow sense heritability. And in this case, in terms of comparing these figures, uh, the pistol length in these flowers shows the highest amount of narrow sense heritability. So in comparison to height in humans and tarsus length in these birds. So 
uh, to study evolution, we need to be able to isolate this component called narrow sense heritability. And it is defined as the amount of variance due to additive effects. And we can estimate that by plotting the uh, mid values or average values for the parents against the values of the offspring. And the slope of that line tells you the degree of narrow sense heritability. We need to know that to study and understand the evolution of these complex phenotypes. What I'm showing you here, uh, what I'm trying to explain here comes out of box 7.2.1, I think it is, where we're diving into some nitty gritty about narrow sense heritability and what we can learn. Uh, in particular, what is being shown here is that from these heritability graphs, we can uh, deduce two things. We can deduce the strength of selection, like how powerful it is. And we can deduce, conclude the response to selection, the degree to which the offspring are different from the parents in the population. So some powerful deductions, some powerful uh, conclusions about how a population is evolving, how it's responding, and we're able to isolate uh, that evolution in terms of the narrow sense heritability. So to start off here then, little h squared, that is the narrow sense heritability. It's the proportion of phenotypic variance transmitted from parents to offspring, the additive effects, not epistatic effects, not dominant effects, additive effects. And so that is, as I've mentioned before, the variance that causes a population to evolve. If that additive component is very high, then the population can respond to selection more strongly and evolve. If that additive component is relatively low, that would mean the narrow sense heritability is low, then the population is not going to be able to respond to selective pressures as dramatically. These graphs and this figure are trying to show you this and also showing you how we can measure the strength of natural selection and the response to selection. So we plot, we, we make plots of many families, many different families in the population where we're plotting the mid-parent trait value, like we looked at before, against the offspring's mean trait value. So we make these plots and um, those plots help us to see how closely the offspring values match the parent values. <clears throat> okay, so point number one, the X and Y axes intersect at the mean phenotypic value of each population. Um, and the higher the slope is, as I mentioned, then the greater the uh, narrow sense heritability, the little, the little h squared. So in the upper plot, figure A, uh, we're just looking at this hypothetical population, and we're doing this plot of mid-parent trait values against offspring mean values, and we do our regression line, and we see, okay, it's pretty steep. We've got an h squared value of 0.8. That's pretty pretty steep, so that means that there's a pretty strong additive component to the variance in this population. Figure B is showing a, a hypothetical population that has very low narrow sense heritability. So we plot the mid-parent uh, trait value against the offspring mean value, and in that case we see that the slope is more narrow. Point two. 20% of the variance uh, 
is attributable to those additive effects. So therefore, that kind of a population isn't going to be able to respond to selection as dramatically because a smaller component of the variance, as we can see in the graph, is additive. Okay, so what we can do is we can uh, look at the difference in the mean trait value between the selected parents, the parents that were able to reproduce, and the starting mean of the entire parent population. If you look at both of these figures, A and B, uh, the selected parents, the ones that were able to reproduce, are represented by shaded circles. And the uh, organisms in that parental population that didn't reproduce are represented by uh, open circles. And so the difference in the mean between those is called the strength of selection. So if you look at that upper figure A, for example, you see that little cluster of shaded circles up in the upper quadrant of the graph, and there's a dotted blue line going right through that cluster. So that's showing you the mean parent trait value for those that reproduced. If you compare that to the mean value for the entire population, that's the vertical black line, the difference between those is the strength of selection telling you kind of how powerful the selection is. So that's what strength of selection is. The difference between the mean value for those organisms that reproduced uh, and the value of the population as a whole. Strength of selection. So in the upper graph, uh, the strength of selection is pretty similar to the lower graph, okay? But how do, how, does, uh, how do the offspring values then compare to the parent values? And that's going to give us our response to the selection. And uh, this is going to be in, you know, affected by the narrow sense heritability, the uh, slope of that line. So what you do for that is the difference between the new mean of the offspring and the starting mean, that's the response to the selection. So the new mean for the offspring, that's the upper blue line that's horizontal. So it's the mean value for the offspring. And then the uh, black line going horizontally uh, below that is the starting mean. And so the difference between those is saying, well, how much the population has responded from the one generation to the next, and that is the response to selection. And you can see in the upper graph, the response to selection is much greater than in the lower graph, because the upper graph is showing that there's a greater degree of narrow sense heritability. And so because of that, you've got a bigger difference uh, between the mean value of the offspring and the original mean value. And so that's because of that slope, bigger value, slope, response to selection. In the lower graph, the narrow sense heritability is much lower. Okay, so I'm going to lower my hand here. It's a lower slope. And so when you look at the difference between the original mean value and now the offspring value, th that's a smaller difference. So the response to selection is lower. The population has responded in a less dramatic way. That's because that narrow sense heritability is lower. So there's a lot here to digest on this figure, but the overall point is that we're able to measure the narrow sense heritability, it's the slope of that line between mid-parent value and mean offspring value. And when we get that kind of a slope, we can examine okay, what component of the original population actually reproduced and were parents, that's the shaded circles, and uh, what's the difference between the mean of them 
and the mean of the overall population starting off. That's the strength of selection. So we can get that. And then we can get the response to selection, the degree to which the population is evolving, by comparing the mean value for the offspring, that dotted blue line going across, against the mean parent value, the original uh, value, and that tells us our response. Those are the overall points here. We want to be able to measure evolution in populations and be able to identify the degree to which uh, the population is evolving due to ge uh, genetic components, additive components, and these approaches are showing you how we can do that and how we can measure that. All right, so I don't know about you, but I think that stuff that I've tried to explain to you here is pretty heavy duty stuff. I mean, it's pretty meaty, you know? So we're really down in the trenches in, in uh, understanding evolution here now. And uh, hopefully you're following along. I think for my part, it takes a lot of uh, ruminating and thinking about all this. And um, uh, I, I imagine the same might be the same for you. So now what we're looking at here is what are the various ways that a population could respond to natural selection? And I think you may have been uh, introduced to these various types of responses when you took Bio 182, presumably at GCC, maybe elsewhere. And so populations can be shaped, they can you know, change over generations in different ways. And we, re we refer to the different ways that populations are responding as directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. Uh, so one thing that's uh, being represented here and shown here is uh, with an experiment that was done with corn. Uh, over many generations, you can see on the x-axis of the graph that's right in the middle of the page showing the ear of corn uh, going up uh, past 80 generations for the purple uh, line and 100 generations for the blue line. So in this corn uh, population, researchers took those ears of corn uh, from those plants that had the highest oil content and selected those, reproduced those, and kept going generation after generation in that experiment by always selecting those, in, those offspring that had the highest oil content. And tracking that uh, is the blue line, if you will, on the graph, high oil content. And so that is showing directional selection. The population is moving in a particular direction because selection is favoring kind of an extreme uh, of the variation and the population is shifting more and more in that direction. Other plants in the original population were selected based on having the lowest oil content in the ears of the corn. And so they ran the experiment for 100 generations uh, with those plants, always selecting those individuals with the lowest amount of oil. And that's kind of the purplish line that you see gradually going down until after generation 80, actually. Uh, then they, the offspring didn't have oil in their corn kernels anymore. So that's directional selection in the other way. Uh, the fly example that is shown in the bottom left of this slide is showing the results of disruptive selection. So if you look at the graph on the bottom right of your slide, it's overall showing you know, directional stabilizing and disruptive selection. So disruptive selection occurs when the mean phenotype, the middle phenotype is selected against, it's the least favorable. And so that means the extremes are favored and we get kind of a, a double curve there, double blip there. So there was an experiment done with fruit flies in uh, over 12 generations 
in which there was disruptive selection. So that is um, only those individuals that had the highest um, number of bristles and those individuals that had the lowest number of bristles were selected. And the flies that had an intermediate number of bristles were not allowed to reproduce. And so over 12 generations, uh, you can see that the distribution of the phenotype shifted from kind of a normal distribution uh, to then kind of being broken up at the bottom of the sequence of 12 generations in the very bottom corner of the slide here. You can see that and it's kind of broken up disruptively. So, um, yeah, the only one that's not being shown here is a kind of case study. The corn showing uh, directional selection, the flies are showing disruptive selection, uh, but stabilizing selection isn't, uh, there's not an experiment here that's showing that. Uh, but stabilizing selection occurs when the mean phenotype is selected. So those individuals with the mean value have the highest reproductive success. And what, what results from that then is that the extreme values are selected against and over generations, the population's uh, distribution of phenotypes is getting more and more squished, being stabilized. So directional, stabilizing, and disruptive selection are all results of what natural selection can do to a population, depending on which ranges in the variation are selected or not. So these are the results of natural selection. So just a couple slides ago, there was a graphic and I explained uh, the strength of selection, uh, which here is, is also being shown as the selection differential, S, the same thing, just S, calling it two different things, but they're the same. Selection differential is the same thing as the strength of selection. And as I pointed out a couple of slides ago, we can calculate the uh, strength of selection by comparing the mean value of the reproducing individuals to the mean value of the population as a whole. And if the difference between the mean value of the reproducing organisms, uh, the difference is big with the mean value of the population as a whole, then, then we have a very a large value for selection differential, strength of selection. If the difference between the mean value and the overall uh, population value is small, then uh, that's going to be a very small selection differential. So the graph is showing you this. The graph is showing you on the left, you have a distribution of phenotypes. There's a normal distribution and boom, right in the middle, there's the mean size. So option one is shown up on the top where we see, oh my goodness, only the biggest individuals are reproducing and the mean of those uh, individuals that are reproducing is much, much greater than the mean of the population as a whole. So there is a big selection differential. The graph on the bottom is showing what happens when there's weak selection. The mean of the reproducing individuals is very, very close to the mean of the population as a whole. And so therefore the selection uh, differential or the strength of, of selection is relatively uh, small. Okay. So selection differential. Differ uh, directional selection, when the population is shifting over generations in a particular direction, it happens, it occurs when the mean phenotype of the breeding individuals, which we can represent as X sub B, B for breeding, differs from the mean of the phenotype of all the individuals in the parent generation, X sub P, parental generation. And so if there is a difference between those two things, we will see directional selection. And so going back to this figure, going back to this graph, the upper part of the graph is showing you, oh, there's going to be a significant amount of directional selection because there's a big difference between the mean in those two values, those who reproduced versus the original. 
whereas the bottom is showing you uh, there's not going to be very much directional selection because the difference between those two means is much less. So directional selection is related to the difference between those two means. Population's response to selection. Again, a couple slides ago, on one slide, I mentioned and talked about how narrow sense heritability can be calculated by plotting the mid-parent values to the means of the offspring. And then from those plots, we can uh, calculate the response to the selection, excuse me, the selection differential, the strength of the selection, and the response to selection, how much the offspring are differing from the parents. Okay. Well, this is focused on that response to selection, and in fact, it's showing you a very simple mathematical equation for how we can calculate the response to selection, the degree to which the offspring are different from the parents. It's the product of the narrow sense heritability, which we can get from the slope of a graph, multiplied by the selection differential, the strength of selection, which we can get by comparing the mean of the reproducing individuals, the parents, to the overall mean. Okay, so we can totally estimate these values by doing these plots, and we can easily calculate the response to selection, the degree to which the population is going to evolve. So, you know, if we ask the question, will natural selection lead to evolution? Well, it depends on how much of the phenotypic variation is attributable to narrow sense heritability. Uh, if you look at this mathematical equation, that should make sense because plug in some kind of hypothetical number. Uh, let's say that there's very strong selection for body size. So those organisms that are the biggest are going to reproduce. Those that are smaller are not going to reproduce. Okay, so that's uh, um, S. That's the strength of selection. Okay, well, to what degree will the population respond to that, you know, strength of selection? That's going to be determined by the narrow sense heritability. So if you calculate the slope of the regression line, parent and offspring value, if that narrow sense variability is very low, got a very low slope, then you plug in a, a small number like that and you'll see the response to selection is not going to be very big. If the narrow sense heritability is steep and we say, ah, there's a very high amount of, uh, of additive variance that is affects the phenotype, narrow sense heritability is high, you plug in that number for like high narrow sense heritability, and you'll get a big response to selection. So if your narrow sense heritability, you know, the slope was like 0.2, and you multiplied that by the selection differential, and you compared that to a, a population where narrow sense heritability is 0.8, obviously the value that has a higher narrow sense heritability, 0.8, you'll have a bigger response to selection. So hopefully that makes sense. And in fact, it's interesting, the middle bullet here on the slide, on the right-hand side of that equation, the narrow sense heritability and the strength of selection, those are the ingredients that Darwin first recognized and talked about and argued as being necessary for evolution in response to natural selection. He argued that genetic uh, uh, the, the amount of the degree to which genetics determines um, the, uh, the trait values of offspring was very important. Heritability is very important. And he argued that the strength of natural selection is also important. Okay, so, so he made those arguments. And what we can see here is he's, of course, correct when we investigate this. So, uh, one overall conclusion then, which I'm trying to summarize on the, on the bottom of the slide, is that even if a trait is weakly heritable, okay, there's a relatively small component of the genetic variance that's additive. Um, if there's strong natural selection, just having even a weak genetic component, the population will respond, it'll evolve. Um, or if heritability is really strong, so you have a steep slope, uh, 
and but natural selection is weak, you're still going to get a response. You can see that by plugging in various values into that equation. And no matter what, the population is going to respond. It's going to evolve. Uh, so that's the upshot here is that we can we can measure these responses to selection by measuring the narrow sense heritability you know, graphically and from that those graphic representations uh, measure the selection differential the strength of selection and voila we can uh, interpret and measure the response to selection how populations are responding to the environment.